it is so good to be back here at Hope. Uh, lots of memories. Uh, for most of my uh, childhood and youth, this is where we worshiped, was in this room. Uh, so my first public speaking was on this stage reading uh, verses at, for the uh, Sunday school program. And, uh, and we used to do plays on this stage as well. Uh, this is actually a really good setting for what we're going to be talking about today because uh, we've got the uh, uh, replica of the original Gemeinhaus out there that uh, many of the men of home church, including my father, helped build uh, to show us what Moravian churches used to be like. Uh, when I was a child, this is what the Hope Church looked like, was this room. It's been remodeled since then. And then, of course, we have the sanctuary. Uh, and that's, uh, so, you know, you can see that as progression, if you like, or just change. And we'll, uh, over the course of the day, we'll be talking about how church may be changing in the future. So I'm doing the history, Andrew's doing the contemporary, uh, and then this afternoon we will have, uh, uh, we'll have some good discussion on where we may be going in the future. Uh, so to uh, start with, we're going to do some opening devotions from the, uh, the Red Hymnal, which some of you grew up with. Uh, I remember when I was here at Hope that uh, as a child, it was controversial moving from the black to the red hymnal uh, was the crisis. Uh, so we're going to start with singing hymn number 244. And I cannot lead music, uh, but if somebody could, we can do it a cappella, but if somebody could get us started. Are you awake, Adam? Oh, this hymnal was before I was born, so. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You would turn over to page 27 for the Te Deum Laudamus, and you may remain seated. We praise thee, O God, we acknowledge thee to be the Lord. All the earth doth worship thee, the Father everlasting. To thee, all angels, cry aloud, the heavens and all the powers therein. To thee, cherubim and seraphim, Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabaoth. <clears throat> the glorious company of the apostles praise thee. <clears throat> the noble army of the martyrs praise thee. <clears throat> 
thine adorable true and only Son, also the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. When thou takest upon thee, tookest upon thee to deliver man, thou dost humble thyself to be born of a virgin. Thou sittest at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father. We believe that thou shalt come to be our judge. We therefore praise thee, pray thee, help thy servants whom thou hast redeemed with thy precious blood. O Lord, save thy people and bless thine heritage. Govern them and lift them up forever. Day by day we magnify thee, and we worship thy name ever, world without end. safe, O Lord, to keep us this day without sin. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us. O Lord, let thy mercy lighten upon us as our trust is in thee. And if Ruth could be the choir. Amen. Uh, Andrew and I decided we would start with morning devotions from old worship materials, and our ending devotions are going to be some of the most recent Mor Moravian worship materials. Uh, but I hope you noticed in that, uh, that old Moravian hymn that you sang so beautifully, uh, when it talks about the highly favored congregation, there's not a word about the building or the organ or any of these other things. Uh, what it did talk about is the blessings of faith in Christ and demonstrating by word and deed who we are. And we are going to see through Moravian history, there have been many ways Moravians have organized themselves into communities uh, to do exactly that. Uh, so an outline for uh, the next um, hour or so. Uh, we're going to talk about origins of Moravian congregations, uh, types of Moravian communities during the time of Zinzendorf, uh, purpose of congregations, transformation of the Moravians in America, a uh, little bit about the southern province's history and how things developed, uh, and then we will move into talking about uh, congregations today. So just a really brief history of the Moravian Church. Believe me, this takes 15 weeks to do thoroughly. Uh, but just to kind of orient folks who aren't familiar with this, uh, the church was founded in 1457 by a young man named Gregory. We call him Gregory the Patriarch. Uh, and 10 years later, they decided to establish their own orders of ministry, uh, elected their own bishops and priests and deacons. Uh, this church was destroyed by religious persecution, war, and uh, uh, many went into exile. It was resurrected again in a place called Herrenhut in uh, Germany uh, under the leadership of Count Zinzendorf. Uh, 1727 was the Brotherly Agreement which organized the community and just five years later they start sending missionaries outside of Europe. Uh, was established, uh, reorganized, and fully established as a separate American denomination in 1857, although they came, Moravians came to America a century earlier. Uh, the Southern Province was established as a separate province in the unity in 1890, even though Moravians settled here in the 1750s. And then in 1957, uh, the worldwide Moravian Church was reorganized, granting uh, the former mission fields the same status that the southern province enjoys as an autonomous province. Um, 
Now, why was the Moravian Church founded originally? Uh, in, to some extent, it was to have better congregations. Uh, Gregory and his friends were frustrated with the established church of their day, the state church, in which people were forced to be part of the church whether they wanted to or not. Uh, and they felt that these uh, congregations weren't really teaching people how to be followers of Jesus. Uh, they formed what today we call an intentional Christian community and they attempted to recreate the church we read about in the New Testament. Uh, a church that didn't need cathedrals and political power, a church dedicated to following the teachings of Jesus. It was very important for the founders of the Unitas Fratrum that we not only worship Jesus, we follow Jesus. Uh, he is not only Savior, He is Lord. Uh, they didn't call this a church. They were very careful about that. For them, church meant the big church that was supported by taxes and tithes and had political power. Uh, they called themselves a unity or a union or a community. It all depends on how you translate the, uh, the check uh, of the brethren. It included sisters too, but it sounded awkward to say, you know, unity of the brethren and cistern. So anyway, they, um, they rejected the parish system. The only way to become part of the Moravian church was to choose to join the Moravian church. Uh, and in the early days, they actually made it harder to join than they made it to leave. Uh, they realized this was an illegal church and it was dangerous to join it and they wanted to make sure you were serious about it. Now those early American con uh, uh, Moravian congregations uh, were voluntary society. Uh, some would say that the Moravians were the first voluntary church to reject the idea of religion and politics being joined. Uh, they were content to let the government do what government does, so long as the government stayed out of what they do as a church. Uh, they, uh, their rules were designed around helping people f follow Jesus' teachings on the Sermon on the Mount, uh, including his teachings on nonviolence. Um, they were to be disciples of Jesus. We hear this a lot in emerging church circles today that the church needs to teach discipleship. Uh, they published uh, guidelines for Christian behavior. As a matter of fact, most of what they talked about at Synod uh, was about behavior, not about doctrine. Uh, and this included your economic life. Uh, they had strict principles on um, what it meant to make a fair profit and how to treat your workers, uh, how to uh, treat your employers. They believe that Jesus' teaching, love your neighbor as yourself, applies in the economic realm, not just in the social realm. So, you know, treat your customer with the same love that you would want to be treated. Oh, shoot. Sure. My fingers are too big. A <laughs> uh, big part of the church, uh, they still had the sacrament of confession, but you didn't have to confess to a priest uh, and be assigned you know, arbitrary penances. Uh, they set it up so that lay people could confess to each other. They even had people in the congregation they called judges, sister judges, brother judges. Uh, because they thought it was wrong for women to have to confess their sins to a man uh, for various reasons. And so we were, ours was one of the first churches with official offices for women in the church. Now, one of the reasons they didn't call themselves the church is was the political institutional church. They didn't want to be identified with that. But also the Church of the New Testament, the body of Christ, they believe exists throughout the world wherever people uh, follow the way of Christ. And so they never believed they were the one true church. 
They are an intentional community within the church. So they had no problem recognizing that there are Christians in the Catholic Church, and when the Protestants come along, Luther and Calvin, that there's Christians in those churches. Uh, and they never believed when they asked someone to leave their church that they were consigning them to the outer darkness. They were, they were a, uh, a group within the big church. I actually think Moravians may be the only church that never had this belief that you have to be a member of this church to be Christian. Uh, it's quite remarkable. Um, they also, uh, where they worshipped, they called sabor, uh, the Czech word uh, for a hall or a meeting house. Uh, they often referred to the church as the brethren's house. Uh, not that dissimilar from the Gemeinhaus house that was built here at Hope. You know, the architecture is a little different, but the concept is the same. In German, this word would be translated Zal. Uh, they didn't talk about having sanctuaries. Uh, and it took a while before these were even separate buildings. In the early days, the pastor lived in part of the brethren's house, often with deacons and acolytes to assist him. And then part of the house uh, was set up so it could be a school during the week and then have worship on Sundays. Almost exactly like the old Gemeinhaus here at Hope, centuries later. Um, so here's a picture of the um, uh, restored original Moravian church. Uh, a little village called Kuhnwald in eastern Bohemia. How many of you have been here? Yeah, I thought I saw some folks who have been here. Uh, and doesn't look at all like our Moravian churches today, does it? There's no eyebrow arch over the door or any of the features of Moravian architecture. And for many years, this is what, basically what Moravian churches looked like. What's an advantage if you're an illegal church to having your buildings look like this? It's just a house. It makes it much harder for the Inquisition to figure out, you know, wh which doors they need to bust in and check on people. Uh, Moravians have tended to keep a kind of low profile in the world, sometimes to our detriment, uh, but sometimes this was very important. Uh, 1467, they had a synod in a little place in the mountains called Lotka, uh, where they ordained their first bishop and priest. And uh, for years, they would publish things to defend the right of Christians to choose their own leadership. Uh, that they don't have to be in succession from the Bishop of Rome, St. Peter and all of that. Uh, they believe that, that bishops are, should live like the apostles. Uh, and what did the apostles do? They went out and preached, and most of them uh, died for their faith. Uh, and they lived in poverty, and this is what they expected of bishops. Uh, believe it or not, for more than 100 years, Moravian uh, ministers were not allowed to get married, uh, like Catholic priests, not because they thought that sex was somehow would make them less holy, uh, but because they knew these people had to be courageous in the face of persecution, and it's much harder to do that if you're caring for a wife and children. They also didn't pay them anything, and so it was hard to feed a family on what Moravians had. Uh, we're a little better on that today, I think. Although, you know, some of the clergy are looking at me like, no, I'm not so sure. <laughs> uh, like I say, people were warned before they joined the church that this is, this is a serious thing, and they also were taught the discipline. As a matter of fact, you could spend years being what was called a beginner before you were moved fully into membership uh, because it, it's a hard way to live to follow the Sermon on the Mount. And this decision in 1467 
uh, in some ways is the true founding of the unity. Uh, you couldn't go back after this point. Now, uh, I've got a much longer lecture on this, but just very briefly, uh, the, what the unity did with their theology is say, clarify what is absolutely essential in Christianity, that if you take this away, you're not Christian, you're not a church in any way, from what ministers to what is essential. You know, what are the sacred things that God has given us to help us become better Christians, and things that are merely incidental, that are um, matters of taste. Uh, you know, whether the minister wears a robe or not, or uh, what music you sing. Uh, and they argued uh, the reason they had to break away from the state church was it had lost what was essential in Christianity. And they were attempting to reclaim it in their church. And they could go from worshiping in these beautiful churches to worshiping in this little house because so much of what went on in church was purely incidental. Um, now, the, there are two sets of three essential things they identified. Uh, the first ones are the work of God, uh, which theologians call grace. And the idea is if God doesn't do these things, nothing else is going to matter about what we do. And this is God's work, not our work. Uh, and the three things are God creates, God redeems, and God blesses us or helps us become holy. Uh, that's all God's work. Uh, we don't save souls, God does. We don't create the world, God does. And we can't be holy without God's help. Um, <coughs> We could go in much more detail on these, but those, just a quick nut, um, uh, thumb sketch on that. Now the essentials on our part are also very clear and in the New Testament. Uh, we respond to God's work in faith, in love, and in hope. Uh, Moravians used to disagree with Martin Luther that said we're saved by faith alone, and they said no, if faith isn't completed in love, it's not really faith. And for them, love is action. It's doing good for people. Uh, it's not feeling good for people, it's doing good for people. I like to use the example of love for neighbor. Uh, we get a lot of snow in Bethlehem. I've got very long sidewalks in front of my house, and as soon as I can, I get out and clear the sidewalks not because I'm going to get fined by the city if I don't clear the sidewalks, but because I don't want my neighbors falling and getting hurt. Some of these people I don't know, some of them I don't even like, uh, but, I, but I still love them by clearing the sidewalks. Uh, the Moravians were real clear that you can't separate these either. Our faith in God as creator, redeemer, and sanctifier leads us into love for God as creator, redeemer, sanctifier, and love for what God has created and what God has redeemed, our neighbors and our world. And if we live in love, then hope will be the natural result. Uh, and so they felt the church of, that they separated was robbing people of their hope and was not teaching them how to love, and the faith wasn't even really faith. Now the ministerial things are the sacred tools that God has given to help us live into this. One of the difference between the essentials and the ministerials is we will carry our faith, love, and hope with us into heaven. They are for eternity. You know, Paul said three things abide, uh, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. All else will pass away. Uh, we won't need Holy Communion in heaven because we will have Christ. We won't need baptism in heaven. Uh, we won't even need uh, ministers. I mean, I mean, we need David Merritt, but not as a minister, right? <laughs> um, 
Now, these things are sacred because they're given by God, but they're especially sacred because they lead us somewhere. If they're not leading to faith, love, and hope, then there's a problem. And the original Moravians felt that's what had happened in the church of their day, that uh, the things the church was doing was not leading people into love. So when our ancestors were tortured by the Inquisition, the Inquisition was quoting scripture at them. That didn't make it holy. Um, so these things are not non-essentials. They are ministerials. They are sacred tools if used uh, for the right purpose. Uh, this is also why Moravians from the beginning could be ecumenically minded. Because if they see these things in other Christian communities, we can recognize one another as Christian, even if they worship different, even if they have a different confession of faith, uh, different architecture, the whole thing. You go to what's essential. Now, uh, we, were, we started by singing, which is an important thing in the Moravian church. It's not an essential thing, thank goodness. Uh, <laughs> Years ago when my brother was in the, uh, the army station in Missouri and he loved playing in the uh, Easter sunrise service down at Old Salem and he got me to take a you know, cassette recorder and uh, record the service and send it to him and then he listened to the tape and he said, great, all I hear is Craig singing. Uh, <laughs> didn't know how microphones worked. Uh, anyway. Uh, but as soon as Moravians get the printing press, they start printing their materials. Moravians published the first Protestant hymnal, even before Martin Luther started his Reformation, uh, because it was important that worship be centered in the community, not just in the choir and the priest. Uh, and it was important that our Christian faith be something you can sing at home. Uh, and these texts often have deep meaning to them. Now, this original Moravian church was a very radical church for its day, and I have found that a lot of Moravians today are still a little uncomfortable with how radical they were. Uh, it was a voluntary church, rejected the union of politics and religion long before the First Amendment. Uh, they were brothers and sisters in the Lord, uh, not hierarchies within the church. Yes, some people had more money than other people, but you, you treated everyone with kindness. Pastors are to be servants instead of lords in the church, which is one reason in Moravian communion, typically, traditionally, the pastor goes out to serve you instead of you coming and kneeling before the pastor. We're not critical of how other churches do it. It was just important for us every time we have communion to remind us all that the pastor who represents Christ comes out to us even when we're, uh, we can't. It was a pacifist church and did not swear oaths, uh, did not serve in the, uh, in the military. It was a church that emphasized education for men and women. One of the things that shocked the Inquisition is that Moravian women knew the Bible better than most Catholic priests and they let women read scripture in church uh, but also rich and poor, that one of the first communities dedicated to educating poor people. And Moravians, wherever they've established church, established schools. And these schools are part of the, the ministry of the church. Uh, important to worship in the language of the people. So from the beginning, uh, they worshiped in Czech. Uh, they wrote their hymns in Czech, the whole service, and this should carry throughout the world, and we'll see how that goes. Uh, sometimes, and one of the reasons I wanted to use the old Te Deum Laudamus is I love it, I always have. It's one of the oldest pieces of Christian worship, uh, Catholics, Lutherans, others. But None of that language sounds familiar, does it? You know, vouchsafe, O Lord. When in your daily life do you say, oh, vouchsafe this uh, check that I give to you? Uh, you know, and at one time, thee and thou meant that God was familiar to us. 
uh, you know, that was the language you used for your children and your parents, not for your Lord. Uh, but we've lost all that. And so when in the afternoon, we can talk about, you know, what it would it mean to speak in the language of people today? Uh, they uh, translated the Bible, first from the Latin and later from the Greek and Hebrew. And a common feature is Moravian congregations were small. Uh, they were very intimate. People knew one another. Uh, and pastors did a lot of pastoral care. Uh, we estimate that it was rare for a congregation to have more than 200 people uh, for this whole period. Uh, but the church grew despite persecution. Estimates vary between 50,000 Moravians and 200,000 Moravians at a time when the world was much smaller. It was a church that uh, was often persecuted. It was illegal. Uh, and this is one of the worship places that Moravians could worship. Uh, we call it Chalice Rocks because uh, according to tradition, they would serve the Holy Communion out here in these rocks. Uh, I've had prayers there, it's quite moving. Now, this church was destroyed. Uh, during the Thirty Years' War, thousands of brethren went into exile, uh, but one of our greatest uh, scholars and bishops, John Amos Comenius, uh, led the exile community and dedicated his life to preserving the witness of the Moravian Church. That even though the church was being destroyed as an institution, its witness could endure. And he did this by publishing hymnals, catechisms, histories, and he even proposed that the Moravian way of doing theology could be a way to overcome church divisions. Let's talk about what's essential in Christianity and unite in our essentials rather than arguing about the way we do ministerials or especially about these incidental things. Uh, I actually know people whose church life was nearly destroyed over arguments over color of carpet and sanctuaries <laughs> and things like this or uh, uh, what color ribbon to put on candles and it's like, you know, we're losing something when, when that is the focus of our life. Uh, so here is a uh, picture of Moravian pastor being uh, expelled from his home. Uh, Comenius's library was burned by, uh, by Christian monks. Uh, the people were forced into exile. And then the church is going to be reborn under the leadership of Zinzendorf in the 1720s in Germany. So it goes from being a Czech church to primarily a German church but it would be an international church. Uh, it's going to, we're going to be the first Protestant church that isn't organized according to our national origin. Uh, not the Swedish Moravian church, but the Moravian church in Sweden uh, and the Netherlands. Uh, the Moravians who settled here in North Carolina, uh, Pennsylvania uh, and Pennsylvania came from a dozen different countries. Uh, and could unite. Uh, Zinzendorf is a brilliant man, and here is kind of a vision of the, of the Moravian communities that he has behind him. Now, uh, Zinzendorf was very concerned that in his day, many Christians were separating from other Christians. Uh, they believed that the church had gotten corrupt, and so they didn't go to church. Uh, they would do, you know, worship on their own, you know, read books. Uh, today, this would be the people who call themselves spiritual, not religious. Uh, and Zinzendorf was concerned that so many Christians were separating themselves, and he felt that in some ways this was because of self-righteousness. I'm, I'm too holy to take Holy Communion with you. And so a lot of his work was trying to win these people back into Christian community. And some of the conflict in the Moravian church is because you had so many strong-willed people with quite different ideas trying to live together. Um, 
He famously said, there is no Christianity without community. It doesn't have to be you know, a large community, but how do we learn how to love our brothers and sisters if we don't deal with them on a regular basis? And for Zinzendorf, the purpose of the church is to teach us how to love. You know, we first learn love as children from parents and siblings uh, and the extended family, uh, but the church is where we learn to love people we're not related to, uh, people in the community, and then we learn that love in the church and we have to take it out into the world. Uh, and that, in a nutshell, is what Zinzendorf's view of the church. Uh, the church should be a place where people experience the joys of heaven. Uh, worship should be like the angels are singing with us. And we actually have old Moravian statements in which they said we could hear the angels singing with us. Um, but it's also a place where people are admonished if their behavior is destructive. Uh, it was a place to learn how to follow the Christian life. Uh, worship for Zinzendorf uh, was something that gives life and energy to our daily lives. It's uh, ideally in the Moravian communities, you would start the morning with worship, you would end the day with worship, you would sing hymns while you work. Uh, but if you're in a place where you can't do that, at least the Sunday morning worship should leave, you should leave church engaged for your work in the world. Uh, it, should, it should give spirit. Now, the place where this was created is called Herrenhut. Uh, and Herrenhut is a unique kind of Christian community. There had never been anything like this in the history of the church in which a village becomes a congregation. Uh, there had been, you know, uh, Churches, cathedrals, monasteries, all sorts of Christian communities. But the idea that people who live and work together, who have families, raise children, that all of this is one congregation was a radical new idea. And that idea would be brought to America in places like Bethlehem or Lidditz or Bethabara or Salem. Um, now, it did not start out well, and I know every year you hear the story of August 13th and the conflict in the community. Um, it's hard to live with people who are different than you, and believe me, everyone is different from me. Uh, the, um, we could talk this afternoon about, what if we keep the church weird? Anyway. Uh, so Zinzendorf, as the feudal lord, instead of kicking people off his estate, he wrote what will be called the Brotherly Agreement. And it's an agreement because everyone would sign it and agree to live this way. Uh, it's a remarkable document. And when you read it, it's mainly about how we treat one another. It, there's not a lot of doctrine in the brotherly agreement, but there is a lot of talk about that if I have a problem with my brother Tim, I talk to Tim instead of going around and talking to Bishop Wrights and saying, you know, uh, brother Tim said something really harsh to me and I'm offended. Uh, and brother Wrights would say, did you talk to Tim about it? And I would say, no. And, he, and I would be the one in trouble for spreading rumors, that kind of thing. Uh, we work things out. We deal with conflict directly is the message of the brotherly agreement. Uh, we acknowledge that there are a lot of Christian doctrines that people are arguing about because the Bible isn't really clear on this. And a unique a Moravian approach to Christian conflict is to say, if Jesus had really thought this was important, he would have told us what to do. So let's acknowledge that we disagree. Some Moravians in Herrenhut believe that only uh, the elect are going to get into heaven. Some believe that anyone who responds to the call of the gospel and comes to faith in Christ will go to heaven. 
Believe it or not, there were some that believed that the redemption of Christ meant everyone is going to heaven. And Zinzendorf had his own ideas, but didn't impose them on the church. Also, uh, Herrenhut was technically part of a Lutheran parish. They were supposed to go to the Lutheran church, but Zinzendorf allowed them to have uh, worship during the week that they developed themselves in a simple room called the Zal. And eventually this would develop into the church that you see in Herrenhut today. Uh, so here's a Moravian Zal. Uh, I know a lot of people that see this and say, this isn't a church. Uh, what do you notice in the Zal? Some of you have been to Herrenhut and had the pleasure to worship there, but you know, what leaps out at you when you see the picture? No stained glass. Uh, and this is in part practical. Uh, if you don't have stained glass, then you don't have to have as many lights in the church during the day. Uh, but uh, clear glass not only lets in light, what does it allow you to do? See the world. And this is very important for a Moravian view of Christianity. What else do you notice? What's that? Undecorated walls. Uh, the nice thing about that is they could hang paintings for different occasions. Uh, but the walls are very simple. And a lot of people say this is very cold and austere, but actually in the 18th century, white is the color of celebration in heaven. Uh, but it's also practical because they had a lot of services at night and when you're lighting by candles, white walls make it much more glowing. Someone had another comment. Movable benches. Movable benches. Uh, I would, took a group of Moravians to a, uh, on a trip, and we were at Rixdorf, Germany, and they decided to have a cookout for us. And so we just took the benches outside uh, so we had things to sit on. Uh, a lot of Moravian services would be better if we could move the benches, wouldn't they? Communion, law feast, and things. Um, no altar, just a simple table, not all this elaborate stuff, not even a pulpit. Uh, so the, um, you know, the pastor actually sits down for part of the service uh, and, you know, not lording it over people. Now, Herrenhut, as a religious community, uh, innovated in their worship. They read a lot of church history, the New Testament, and said, are there things from the past that we can bring into the present in a new form? You know, they knew they weren't doing it exactly the way the apostles did, but they wanted to capture the spirit of what the apostles did. So this is a Moravian worship service. Uh, does this look like anything you've done in church on a Sunday morning? Uh, do you know what, uh, so they're washing each other's feet as a religious service. The pastor is sitting at the liturgist table. Uh, if you look real carefully, it's a little ambiguous whether it's a male or female pastor, because at this time we had ordained women. Uh, we got artwork that's hard to see uh, hanging on the wall. It's Christ praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, the daily text was a radical innovation. The idea that you could take, you know, a verse of scripture for the day for the whole community. And it was called the watchword because this was kind of like your, your passcode to show that you were a, a heron hooter, uh, as if you knew the daily text that day. It was to bind us all together. But this idea that, you know, you can cut up the Bible and take verses out of context and find meaning in it, a lot of people were opposed to this. It was a highly criticized thing. But by the 20th century, a million copies of the daily text are being published in German every year. Uh, there were, there's never been more than about uh, 10,000 Moravians in Germany at any time. Uh, so these daily texts started for the community and become a major devotional guide around the world. Uh, when I was in Rome at the Waldensian Seminary, they were so proud that they were now doing the Moravian daily text in Italian. Uh, and uh, many other languages. 
They are. Uh, there's yeah, two groups. Is that uh, for, for certain things. Uh, so sometimes the antiphonal singing Moravians do, you'd be set up this way singing back and forth. Um, and you can see, this picture doesn't show up real well on the projector, but this is all women. Uh, they didn't do foot washing between men and women. You know, they were separate groups because, you know, you don't want a man seeing a woman's ankle. It could, you know. Uh, uh, the love feast was a radical innovation and a very controversial one. Believe it or not, this is one of the things people were suspicious about the Moravians because they would have these meals in church. And originally the love feast was your meal. Uh, so, you know, the old love feast bun recipe, the Salem, those buns weigh about a pound and a half. Uh, <laughs> because it was your breakfast, and you would start the work day with the love feast. Uh, and I emphasize this because, you know, we've made the love feast, uh, I, and I love love feast, but sometimes, you know, we get a little bent out of shape over love feast, and we forget only two things are required for a love feast. What are they? Love and food. <laughs> First love feast in North Carolina was pumpkin mush. You know, uh, when, when we started drinking coffee for love feasts, people were aghast that we're doing coffee instead of tea, which is what Christ served at his love feast. Anyway. Um, <laughs> think for a moment about who you eat with on a regular basis in your life. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Who do you, who do you eat with? Family. Family? Yeah, friends. Friends? Coworkers? Strangers in restaurants. Stra yeah, are you eating with them? <laughs> Not really. Sort of. But you look around at the strangers in the restaurant, they tend to be people like you, right? Uh, the Moravian love feast was so controversial because commoners are being served sometimes by aristocrats. Nowhere in the world would that happen. Poor people and rich people, are, middle class people, are eating together. There were love feasts in which you know, adults serve food to the children. Uh, and then when the Moravians start their worldwide mission, imagine in the Caribbean and certain parts of America uh, that white people are serving food to black people and eating with them. I remember what it was like in high school, Reynolds High School, 1978. You know, you walk into the cafeteria, it meant something where you sat at the table, right? You know, your clique or your race, uh, all of these things. And the Moravian Love Feast was this radical statement that we are one in Christ. And uh, my favorite love feast of all time uh, was every year at the uh, Five Yesterdays program in Old Salem where we got all the kids who have learned Moravian stuff and we'd end with a love feast. And most of them were not Moravian, so I'd have to explain this stuff. Uh, just delightful. Uh, but I think one of the important things of the Moravian love feast is that we don't eat until everyone is served. And I've often wondered, what would happen if all the Christians in the world just on one day decided not to eat till everyone is served? Uh, so this was a radical innovation. Um, now, uh, Moravians had different types of Christian communities in the time of Zinzendorf. The one we talk about the most are the settlement congregations, like, you know, with Salem. Uh, we have museums and things. Christiansfeld and uh, Denmark is a world heritage site, Zeist. Uh, we had about 22, 22 or 24 of these religious communes in various places in the world. But that's not the only way Moravians did church. Uh, they had city and country congregations that were organized differently. Hope was a country congregation. It didn't have all the elaborate stuff at Salem but it was still a valuable congregation. Uh, they had mission congregations, uh, which were different again. 
Uh, and uh, many of the people living in the mission congregations were enslaved people, uh, people who were being abused in various ways. And the Moravians are, uh, these are people that didn't grow up in a Christian context and you have to teach things differently. And it could be, uh, uh, so they're organized different. And then they had something that we don't talk a lot about, but I want us to think about this morning. It was called the diaspora. Uh, in the Bible, it refers to the Jews being dispersed around the world. Uh, and the Moravians felt that uh, Moravians should be dispersed around the world. And this actually started before the foreign mission of sending people out, uh, often lay people, not ordained people, as teachers, music leaders, uh, helpers in various ways within the established church with the permission of the pastor to run a society within the congregation, voluntary group that would meet on Sunday evening or Saturday evening, uh, would sing Moravian hymns, would read Zinzendorf sermons or other sermons, would use the Moravian liturgy, uh, would talk about how to be better Christians in their world. Uh, and some important people came out of these diaspora societies. The great philosopher Søren Kierkegaard in Denmark grew up in the society in Copenhagen. He never joined the Moravian church officially, but he was strongly influenced by this. Uh, these um, uh, Moravians weren't the only people doing this. There were other uh, pious Christians in Germany forming these small groups. And again, they're not churches, they're groups within churches. Now in the Baltic region, Latvia, Lithuania, those parts of the world, this was extremely popular. And one scholar has estimated that as many as 100,000 people were involved in these diaspora societies at a time when there's only about 10,000 official members of the Moravian Church, or 20,000. Uh, and all over Europe, um, excuse me, uh, in England, uh, John Wesley is gonna pick up on this idea. Uh, and his bands and his Methodist societies are rooted in this idea. Now, the discipline in these societies was stricter than the, you know, the church, but it was a voluntary discipline. You know, you, you helped live this way, but it was not as strict as like living in Salem or Christians felt. Uh, one of the most important things of the society is teaching people how to be Christian disciples. Um, now, the congregations were established where it was legal to do so, uh, and, uh, and where there were enough Moravians to actually form a congregation. They had a stricter discipline, the choir system, you know, of men and women, all of that. Uh, it's interesting, many of the uh, settlements, especially here in America, you would gather on Sunday morning, early in the morning to pray the litany, and then you would come back later for a preaching service, and then later in German, and then there would be the English service at which outsiders were invited to uh, participate in. Um, now, People, especially in the country and city congregations, you still had your daily work life. You weren't around Moravians all the time like you were elsewhere. Now the mission congregations, uh, I know y'all have heard the story of the mission, uh, and wherever they could get enough converts, they would immediately start forming communities uh, to help people live into this new faith. Uh, Zinzendorf famously told the missionaries, don't try to recreate Herrenhut. And then famously, the oldest congregation of the Moravians in this part of the world is New Herrenhut on St. Thomas. So uh, people didn't always follow what Zinzendorf taught. Uh, one of the most extraordinary things Zinzendorf taught in missions is respect the culture of the people that you are bringing the gospel to. 
And in so far as possible, let them continue to dress the way they dressed and live according to their culture. And it's especially important that worship be in their language. Uh, so you don't convert people by making them Europeans and then making them Christians. This was radically different than the Catholics than the other Protestants who tended uh, to make people learn their language. So here, this is Moravian worship in Greenland. Uh, quite different kind of church, isn't it? Uh, but we see that this is a baptism going on. Uh, not sure we today would want to do baptism with a large tub and dumping buckets of water on people's heads, but it's okay to do that. Moravians are highly unusual people in that we've never said one mode of baptism is proper. Uh, I was really struck with the new Moravian work in Peru uh, and uh, Betsy Miller from the Northern Province and Bishop Sam Gray are down and they want to do, uh, uh, they want to do baptisms. And so just to make a point, uh, they do the first person by immersion the next person by a little less immersion until you get to the last person who has water poured on their head to just say, you're all baptized. Uh, that, that's not what is essential, how you do it. That's incidental. You also see that it's so cold, you have to wear heavy, heavy clothes. Uh, one of my favorite stories from Greenland, but some of you have heard is, uh, the Lutherans had been doing mission in Greenland long before the Moravians came. Moravians are not the first Protestant missionaries. Uh, and when you get to something like, you know, in the Bible, Jesus is the Lamb of God, uh, the Lutheran approach, which is the typical approach, uh, you know, the Greenlander said, you know, what's a lamb? And so you have to do education, bring pictures, bring a lamb over, tell them all about Old Testament sacrifice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the Moravian missionaries come and the Greenlanders say, uh, what's a lamb? Y'all keep talking about Jesus as the lamb of God. Uh, and the Moravian missionary is thinking and thinking. And it occurs to them that in Greenland, the animal that gives his life so the people can live is a seal. And so they simply translated that Jesus is the seal of God. Much simpler approach. Uh, highly controversial at the time. <laughs> Still is, uh, but wouldn't it be fun to have the Moravian seal with the seal on it? Anyway. <laughs> Throughout the Senzendorf period, uh, the church focused on education as well as worship, uh, especially in the mission congregations. You've got to teach people, uh, you know, sometimes a whole new way of being. And one of the, when you read the mission records, the missionaries are constantly trying to figure out, okay, what, what can we discard of what we think is Christianity in order to make this easier? But also are there things in the culture that wouldn't be appropriate, like burning people alive for the Iroquois and things like that. Uh, it's really a remarkable process. And one of the great innovations Moravians made in missions, first people to do that, this is to take recent converts and train them to be evangelists. Uh, and these, uh, these people knew the language, the culture, and could interpret what the missionary is saying better, but also teach the missionaries about the culture and you know why, you know, I know you weren't meaning to be offensive, but what you just said was really offensive to people. It's very important. Uh, now, especially in the, um, uh, in the Caribbean and Africa, the missionaries also took on the task, especially after emancipation of slaves, of operating schools to help people learn how to live in this new world uh, that the Europeans have forced upon them. Uh, so how to read and write and various things. One of the oldest pieces of written literature from an um, Afro-Caribbean woman was a letter sent to the Queen of Denmark uh, asking that the Moravian missionaries have permission to keep doing their work. Uh, so when we talk about the church, 
This is a famous painting to show the Moravian idea of the church. And what do you see in this painting? It's called First Fruits. Adam's smiling because he's seen this a dozen times. A real variety of people. And how can you tell there are different kinds of people? Some are black, some are brown. You know, we've got, it's not just a black and white issue. There's a dozen skin tones here. How else can you tell? How they're dressed. I can guarantee you no other church in this time would show people in heaven dressed like this. Uh, and what you don't know is ev everyone depicted in this picture is a real person and we know their name. So for instance, this is uh, Wasampa, who was the first Mohican to join the Moravian church. And at the time this picture was painted, every one of these people had already died. Uh, so uh, Moravians were the most multicultural church other than the Catholic church in the world at the time. Uh, and more than the Catholic Church, respected the cultures of the people. Uh, now, the settlement congregations like Herrenhut uh, uh, are very important, and we can talk about those more at another time. But here's one of the Moravian settlements. Uh, some of you, I know you've been to Old Salem, some of you have been to Bethlehem. Uh, these Moravian settlements are huge. Huge buildings, you know, for the choir houses and everything. Hugely expensive. Uh, the Moravian mission to North Carolina was an enormous investment in money. Uh, purchasing 100,000 acres of land, uh, building these buildings. It showed great organizational skill. I think one of the things that was most brilliant about Zinzendorf was his ability to recognize talent and give people permission to use their talents and build things up. Uh, these Moravian settlements uh, you know, took care of you from cradle to the grave. Uh, education for everyone. Uh, years ago, I was asked to speak uh, to a civic uh, organization in Winston-Salem. And I said, you know, when the Moravians ran this town, we had uh, universal health care and full employment, and that's all I expect from my local government. Um, they didn't invite me back. Anyway, um, everyone is buried in God's acre. And how did they bury them in God's acre? By choir and in the order you die. You know, not the rich in one place, the poor in another place, the aristocrats in one place and another place. Um, they had lots of church offices. It wasn't just pastor and bishop and PAC, and nearly every position in the settlement was uh, men and women both held those positions. So, in the Zinzendorf period, Moravian idea of congregations. Uh, congregations exist so people can experience the joy of heaven in this life and give them hope for the rest of their life. Uh, if your congregation isn't sending people out with hope and looking for the future with joy, something's wrong. Uh, congregations helped people learn to live as disciples of Christ. Uh, Moravian congregations have always tended to be small because there were high demands placed upon you. And pastors were shepherds of the flock. Uh, they were to preach the gospel teach the Bible, teach doctrine, preside over the rites and sacraments, uh, and supervise the leaders of the congregation. Uh, pastors did not do all the pastoral cares at any time in Moravian life. Uh, lay people did a lot of the visiting and caring for people. Uh, lay leadership is an important part of Moravian congregations to train people how to do this. Discipline and discipleship were joined. And congregational life should be joyful. So then comes the American Revolution. Uh, we'll skip ahead a lot of history. Uh, America is the first government to separate church and state with the First Amendment. Uh, there were profound challenges the Moravians faced uh, with the revolution because they're an international church with Moravians in England, you know, and other places. Uh, we survived the revolution, 
barely. It was a rough and rough time. But religion changed in America with the First Amendment. Um, if I want to start a new denomination, a new religion, I am perfectly free to do that. All I need to do is get followers. You know, I can do the Church of the Latter-day Atwoodites if I want. Uh, there's no legal restrictions on that. Uh, but for the Moravians, uh, this was new. They had always been a voluntary society, but now all churches were. And all churches have to learn how to raise money to pay their pastor because there's not church taxes, et cetera, how to recruit members. Um, and the result of the First Amendment is America becomes more religious rather than less religious because churches actually have to communicate to lay people and convince them to join. And so there's a movement called the Second Great Awakening, um, which is one of the biggest increases in the Christian church in history. And one of the most extraordinary stories of early America is that a large enslaved population is converted to Christianity and begins to establish African-American churches with different culture and uh, ways of worship. It's extraordinary. Oh, uh, not again. Uh, United States expands westward and going into the frontier and the new churches are the ones who are most successful at following people uh, west, Baptist and Methodist. Uh, the churches with less denominational structure typically did the best during this period of time. But the Moravian response to the, all this excitement of the Second Great Awakening was to say, we're not going to have any part of it. <laughs> Uh, we're not going to do these revivals. We're not going to do this emotional singing, etc. Here's a picture of a Second Great Awakening revival, and Moravians looked at this kind of stuff and went, oh, no, that's not true Christianity. My old professor, David Schottschneider, said one time he was reading a Moravian record, and a woman said, this church service was so overwhelmingly move moving, I almost spoke up. You know, while the Methodists are shouting and dancing and all of this. Uh, the Moravian Church in America goes through a real slow period for about 75 years. Uh, difficulty adjusting to the culture of the United States. Moravians, by and large, except here at Hope, which was English speaking, but they're still speaking German for a century after coming to America. Uh, they remained technically under German control. We were the only church that didn't separate from Europe at the time of the revolution. Like the Episcopal Church is not the Anglican Church any longer. Uh, Moravians stopped doing evangelism. They focused just on their community life. They were willing to let people join them, but they're not, they, they used to have extensive evangelical preaching networks. Uh, they don't start what they call church extension until the middle of the 19th century, and that was primarily uh, to German and Norwegian immigrants out west. So, for 75 years, there's virtually no increase in membership in the Moravian church at all. It's almost a flat line for 75 years. Now, with people having four to eight children, and you have a flatline membership, what does that tell you? The children are leaving. They're, you know, only one or two children in, uh, are staying. Uh, the Methodist grew, oh, sorry. The Methodist grew from 300 members at the start of the American Revolution to around a million at the, in 1850. Uh, population of the United States increased fivefold. If it had kept up with the population, there would have been five times as many Moravians. Before 1850, there's only one Moravian church west of the Appalachian Mountains. And so, there's increasing agitation to have an American Moravian church, a, to adjust to America but it's coming 75 years after the revolution. Uh, 
It's finally approved at General Senate in 1857, which is why I say the Moravian Church as a denomination in America, the American Moravian Church in some ways was created in 1857. And what we see after this is all of the Zals, all of the Gemeinde houses are either torn down or remodeled to look more like other American churches. Uh, and, you know, in many of our congregations in the southern province, you can see this. If you want to see a traditional Zal, go to Bethabra, it's uh, one of the few. Um, 1876 is the first Moravian hymnal produced by Americans for Americans that adopted American music uh, and not as much of the old German hymns. Start getting American style weddings, American funerals. Um, Moravians actually have to learn how to take up a collection in church. They had never done that before. Uh, they financed the church through uh, large benevolent gifts from wealthy people and voluntary gifts, but not as a ritual in church that you, you know, have to give your money. Uh, and increasingly after 1857, Moravians will define a congregation as an organization that can pay a pastor. Uh, that can have regular worship and somehow pay the pastor's salary. Before, pastors were paid by the church. Here in the southern province, it's kind of unique. I think your check comes from the province, but the congregation has to give the money to the province to pay the check. Um, this is the man who did the most to uh, create the American Moravian Church, Edmund de Schweinitz direct descendant of Zinzendorf who decided that Zinzendorf was the problem and we needed an American church. Also, American Christianity is remarkably diverse, right? Uh, and in the 19th century, you get not only new churches like the Seventh-day Adventist, uh, but new uh, religions associated with Christianity like the Mormons. And the Moravians are trying to figure out where do we fit in this, this context. And they chose to be part of what is sometimes called mainline Protestantism. Uh, these are churches that had been, for the most part, the old state Protestant churches. Lutheran, Episcopal, Presbyterian, Congregationalist. Uh, and the mainline churches all kind of cooperated with one another uh, and mainly served uh, uh, the upper and middle classes. Uh, the the African Methodist Episcopal Church uh, will be just a little different in that regard. They left Catholics to serve poor immigrants from Europe. Uh, evangelicals and Protestants and other Pentecostals and so forth tended to serve the poorer populations. <clears throat> The term mainline was to say we are the respectable churches. So mainline churches would often refer derisively to the holy rollers, uh, to uh, uh, those, those more exuberant forms of worshiping. Uh, and one of the ways you proved you were in the mainline churches is by building colleges, eventually nursing homes. Moravians didn't have enough money to build hospitals, but there was this sense of creating stable institutions. Uh, like I say, they had changed their architecture. They started adding uh, you know, pews and uh, pulpits. Some Moravian churches even will have an altar uh, they start talking about chancels and narthexes and sanctuaries, terms that were never used in Moravian architecture. Um, we get congregations that move away from having God's acres and start burying like Moravians as well, uh, such as Niski Hill. Uh, we're running long, sorry about this, but just quickly on the southern province, 1835, the Southern Province starts the Home Missionary Society to send preachers to rural areas. So, one time, New Philadelphia Church was on the fringe of society. It was a country congregation. 
And it was the first new Moravian church started since before the revolution. Uh, Macedonia, they actually went across the Yadkin River. And, you know, can there be Moravians on the other side of the Yadkin? Uh, people weren't sure. Uh, 1858, Christian Lewis and Friedland, as uh, soon as the denomination is founded, uh, starts having extended revival services associated with August 13th. And the PEC's initial response is to tell them, don't do that. That's not our way. But they were so popular, uh, they gave in and said, okay, we'll keep it under control. You know, no shouting, no, uh, no fainting. Uh, and other congregations picked it up. I grew up on revival services here at Home Church. Uh, uh, and I'm convinced air conditioning is what killed revivals. Uh, because if you're not sweating and filling the fires of hell around you, it just doesn't have the same impact. Uh, by 1890, these revivals were a regular feature of Southern Moravian life and in the Western District as well. Uh, but here we see, you know, Moravians in the South continued to bury uh, the traditional way the Easter sunrise service develops into one of the greatest outreach services of the Moravian church. You know, 8,000 people come to Old Salem at Easter. Uh, most of those people are not Moravians. And I, uh, I drive down 500, my wife and I, 500 miles every year to have Good Friday Home church love feast, it's the best worship service in the world. Uh, and Easter dawn service at Salem, and then I come, we come here for hope for the Easter dawn service at 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, it's not quite dawn, but it's still the same service. And I try to explain this to people, you know, what do you do? And it's like, well, we stand around and say, this I verily believe, and listen to the band. It's like, that's all? It's like, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> Uh, Ron, our Edward Ron Tyler from Pennsylvania came down after the Civil War and uh, uh, completely reorganized the Moravian Church and started founding new congregations that weren't part of the old settlement model. And finally, in 1890, the Southern District emerges as a separate province responsible for its own affairs. Uh, 2,700 adults when Ron Tyler came, that's how small this church was in the southern province, had grown uh, significantly by the time of World War I, but will grow even more in the 20th century. Uh, 14 new congregations in less than 20 years under his leadership, a total of 24 new congregations by 1900, when industry comes to the South, Ron Toller said, you know, this is a new opportunity with the textile mills and so forth. And so we began to establish chapels like Pine Chapel and other places to serve people who are moving into these areas. Uh, the Moravians finally embraced the Sunday school movement and a lot of our churches at one time were Sunday schools. And that was a legitimate form of Christian community. So these are the churches in the 1890s. Some of you are from these church, some of these churches. Uh, 1920s, still building churches, and then the Depression came and slowed things down. Um, most of these churches are still around in one form or another. I forget. <laughs> It did not last long. <laughs> uh, after World War II, uh, there was a, a boom in religion uh, throughout the America, not just uh, Protestant, Catholics, Jewish. I mean, there was just a huge focus on religion after the war, in part because of the Cold War. Uh, Russia was atheist, so America is going to be religious. It gets and. Uh, uh, government and business saw religion as a tool to resist uh, the Marxist. Uh, but what we see is especially the mainline churches embrace the baby boom. 
Uh, and so uh, begin to establish churches in the suburbs or encouraging people to drive in from the suburbs. And they start having full service churches, uh, softball leagues, uh, women's fellowship, men's fellowship, uh, a whole variety of services. Pastors increasingly become seen as counselors uh, and have professional staff. Membership in the Moravian Church peaked around 1961 in the United States during this boom, uh, expanding to Florida, which is growing, and California. So by 1965, Virtually every Moravian congregation in the United States had its own building and professional staff. Hope Church is part of that story. Uh, for more than 100 years, Hope Church had not had its own pastor dedicated to Hope Church until around the time my family joined in 1962 with John Walker. Um, some churches had lots of staff. You know, paid secretaries, organists, choir directors, uh, CE directors. Uh, you know, when we talk about the social support the church provided people, even non-members, you know, doing weddings, marriage counselings, funeral, grief counselling. Uh, if you used to read Dear Abby, she used to say to people, go talk to your pastor uh, or your rabbi. Uh, and increasingly after 1965, Moravian pastors spend a lot of their energy visiting people in hospitals, uh, and much less in teaching, preaching, and other things. So here's the uh, chart. Uh, this is around the time Ron Tyler is asserting himself. You see this steady growth up until 1960, a little dip and then a steady decline in recent years. Uh, despite significant expenditures, despite having boards and agencies and programs, uh, there's not a single cause for the decline. We could talk about that later, but it is significant. Uh, with the, the and it's not just Moravians, all the mainline churches declined and lost a lot of their former political strength. So uh, the president doesn't come and talk to the National Council of Churches, but to the National Prayer Breakfast and other groups. Uh, got eclipsed by newer, more flexible denominations, sometimes called non-denominational churches. Uh, some are mega churches. Uh, some embrace new media, new music, and other things. Similar to the situations the Moravians faced after the American Revolution. But there's a spiritual hunger in America that's well documented by sociologists. Uh, some people left the mainline churches for uh, other Christian churches where religious experience was a major focus as it was in the old Moravian church. But we also get lots of people who leave Christianity for Eastern religions, for yoga and other spiritual practices. Uh, spirituality in America became highly individualized so that people will routinely say, I'm spiritual but not religious, meaning I do spiritual stuff in my home or with a small group of people but don't go to church. And millions of people in the 1980s, 90s, continuing to our day, simply left uh, religion altogether. A lot of them because of various forms of spiritual and physical abuse. Uh, the scandals in the Catholic Church have hurt Protestants as well as Catholics. Um, and so here's the chart of the more recent decline of the Moravian Church. I can tell you the northern province in 2017 had the exact membership it had in 1917. Uh, this decline would be much greater if it had not been for immigrant congregations coming in with Moravians from the Caribbean and Central America. So some people call this a post-denominational age, and there's a lot of anxiety over this. Um, the truth is many 
congregations and the so-called mainline Protestant churches are no longer sustainable in terms of resources. Uh, too much money is invested in buildings, too little in, uh, in ministries. Uh, if we do this demographically, it gets even more severe when we look at the average age of worshipers in Moravian congregations. Uh, both the North and the South have gone through uh, restructuring programs that have had some success, but, uh, not, but are going to be doing more restructuring. And congregations are filled with anxiety over these issues. We'll be talking more about that. So are there models from the past that might help us for the future? Uh, Moravians have had different types of worshiping communities, discipleship communities, mission communities. In the past, we had periods where we were incredibly flexible and innovative, and some of that we still celebrate with our traditions, often forgetting that these things were once radical and new. Uh, it's unrealistic to try to recreate Old Salem. Uh, it's unrealistic to try to recreate the Sunday school movement of the 1920s. Uh, what we need to learn from that example is how to do the 2020s. Uh, I think that diaspora ministry might be a good model that we could find in a no new way. Uh, why don't Moravians produce material for people outside the Moravian church? Why don't we boldly proclaim what we think is essential in Christianity? What if we start talking more about communities or the unity of the brethren, the sabor, the zal, and less about churches? Uh, communities of faith that do not require single purpose worship spaces. Uh, I wish we still had those Zalls. There's a lot more we could do with them. Uh, we may not need, every community doesn't need a full-time professional pastor, but they need education. Uh, the old Moravians did train diaspora workers and supervise them, uh, but largely they were able to uh, adapt their own uh, situation, flexible. And congregations emerged where there were enough people that wanted to create a new congregation. So uh, I'll end with uh, Spangenberg, a Moravian theologian who defined a living congregation as a community where people experience the joy of salvation in Christ and help one another become better disciples. They do this while respecting other churches, seeking the good of their neighbors, but are fearless in following Christ and doing his will. They share their lives in intimate spiritual fellowship and learn to love. A true congregation, according to Spangenberg, is a community, not an organization. So the essentials. Uh, faith in God as creator, redeemer, and one who makes us holy. Love for God and for our neighbors. Hope in this life and confident that we will be with Christ in the next life. How we organize congregations to live into these essentials and how we organize our province is a secondary goal. The essentials are what we need to focus on. So, thank you.